Welcome to another IB Environmental Systems and Societies video. Today's topic is the standard level content for topic 2.4, climate and biomes. This map behind me shows how Earth's major ecological zones are distributed around the world. These patterns aren't random. They're the result of complex interactions between atmospheric and oceanic systems that create distinct climatic conditions in different regions. We're going to examine how these conditions shape Earth's biomes and how they're responding to environmental change. So let's get into it. Let's begin with a fundamental distinction in environmental systems, the difference between climate and weather. Climate describes the atmospheric conditions that are averaged over long periods, typically 30 years or more. Weather refers to the conditions at a particular moment or over a short period. Think of temperature, humidity, air pressure, and wind speed. These factors comprise both weather and climate, but on very different timescales. This desert scene perfectly illustrates the distinction between weather and climate. While we see evidence of rainfall with this rainbow, that's weather, the climate of the region remains consistently hot and dry when averaged over decades. The sparse vegetation and the exposed rock formations testify to the long-term arid conditions that truly define this environment, regardless of the occasional precipitation events like this storm. A biome represents a group of comparable ecosystems that have developed under similar climatic conditions wherever they occur on Earth. What's fascinating is how similar conditions produce similar ecological communities, even when they're separated by really big distances. Tropical rainforests share key characteristics, whether they're in South America, in Africa, in Southeast Asia, because they experience similar temperature and rainfall patterns. Ecosystems that develop under similar conditions show remarkable parallels in their structure and their function. Three main factors determine biome distribution. Precipitation, temperature, and insulation. That's the amount of solar radiation reaching Earth's surface. These abiotic factors create the conditions that shape plant and animal communities, resulting in distinct biome types across the globe. Abiotic factors are the non-living components that determine where different biomes develop. For any given combination of temperature and rainfall, a particular type of natural ecosystem is likely to emerge. The Whitaker diagram we see here shows how temperature and precipitation work together to create different biome types, from tundra to tropical rainforest. This graph demonstrates how temperature and precipitation interact to create distinct biome types. Notice how tropical rainforests occur where both temperature and rainfall are high, but deserts develop in areas where the temperature is high, but the precipitation is low. Tundra appears where temperatures are low, regardless of the precipitation levels. This relationship helps us predict what kind of an ecosystem is going to develop under specific climatic conditions. And here we see how precipitation, temperature, and light, all influenced by latitude and altitude, interact to create distinct biomes. The pattern shows how these factors vary systematically across different latitudes. That creates zones where specific biomes are likely to develop. Understanding these relationships helps us predict how climate change can affect the distribution of biomes. Biomes can be categorized into several major groups. Freshwater, marine, forest, grassland, desert, and tundra. Each of these has characteristic abiotic limiting factors, and those factors affect its productivity and its biodiversity. These categories can be further divided into subcategories. For instance, forests include temperate, tropical, and boreal types, each with its own distinct characteristics. Let's examine the tropical rainforests. Its key limiting factors include nutrients being locked in biomass rather than the soil, and high rainfall that leaches nutrients out of the soils. Despite these limitations, tropical rainforests have very high productivity due to year-round warm temperatures, high solar radiation, and very consistent precipitation every month. This results in the highest biodiversity of any terrestrial ecosystem anywhere on the planet. Hot deserts present a stark contrast to rainforests. Their primary limiting factors are minimal precipitation, high evaporation rates, and extreme temperature differences between day and night. These conditions severely restrict productivity because water is essential for photosynthesis. The harsh environment results in low biodiversity because few species can adapt to such extreme conditions. 
tundra biomes face different challenges. Short days severely limit photosynthesis and productivity, while frozen winter conditions and waterlogged summer soils further restrict plant growth. The slow nutrient cycles and extreme conditions result in limited biodiversity. It's simply too cold for reptiles, amphibians, and most invertebrates to survive outside of a few short summer months. Temperate grasslands, also known as steppes or prairies, occupy a middle ground. They receive less precipitation than forests, but more than deserts. They have seasonal temperature extremes and relatively slow nutrient cycling, and that limits productivity. However, these ecosystems support really high biodiversity because they have so many different plant species and their nutrient-rich soils support really extensive food webs. Aquatic biomes face unique limiting factors. Water absorbs light, and that restricts photosynthesis at depth. In deep oceans, there's no light at all for photosynthesis. In temperate and polar regions, surface waters may freeze seasonally. This creates varying levels of productivity, from the high productivity coral reefs in the tropical areas to low productivity deep ocean zones. This table helps us compare how different biomes respond to limiting factors. Notice how each biome type has evolved distinct strategies to cope with its particular environmental challenges. These adaptations influence both the productivity of the system and its capacity to support biodiversity. The productivity patterns we see across biomes directly relate to their abiotic conditions. From the high productivity of tropical rainforests to the low productivity of deserts and tundra, we can trace these differences back to the availability of water, light, and nutrients. Biodiversity patterns follow similar trends but aren't identical to productivity patterns. Some biomes, like temperate forests, maintain high biodiversity despite having lower productivity than tropical rainforests. This reminds us that multiple factors influence species diversity. The tricellular model of atmospheric circulation helps explain a bunch of these global patterns. This model shows how air moves in three major cells in each hemisphere, distributing heat and water around the planet. This circulation creates predictable patterns of rainfall and temperature at different latitudes. When we look at this diagram, we can see the three main cells, the Hadley cell near the equator, the feral cell in the mid-latitudes, and the polar cell near Earth's poles. Hot air contains more energy and water vapor than cold air, which explains why tropical zones typically receive more precipitation than polar regions. Oceans play a really important role alongside atmospheric circulation in determining climate patterns. They absorb solar radiation and distribute heat through ocean currents. This oceanic conveyor belt helps moderate temperatures globally and it influences local climate patterns, especially in coastal regions. This map shows how tropical oceans absorb sunlight and distribute heat towards the poles. The warm surface flow and cool subsurface flow at depth creates a global circulation pattern that helps regulate Earth's climate system. Ocean currents have a profound effect on coastal climates. Notice how the maritime locations experience moderate temperature differences throughout the year doesn't go as high, it doesn't go as low, but continental areas that are far away from the oceans show more extreme seasonal variations. They have cold winters and hot summers. Global warming is fundamentally altering these long established patterns. As average temperatures rise, we're seeing shifts in biome boundaries and changes in ecosystem function. These changes are happening more rapidly than many species can adapt. These maps of the hardiness zones in North America show how climate zones are shifting towards the poles. Compare the hardiness zones from 1960 to 1990 with projections for 2050. Notice how zones are moving northward. That requires species to either adapt, to migrate, or face local extinction. Looking at these changes across Africa, we can see that there are some dramatic shifts in tree biomass, in grass biomass, and total biomass from 2008 projected into 2100. The tricellular model helps us understand why these changes follow particular patterns as global temperatures rise. That's it for standard level ESS topic 2.4, climate and biomes. If you can explain the relationships between climatic factors like light, temperature, and precipitation with the productivity and biodiversity of different biomes around the world, you're gonna do just fine on your ESS exams. Until next time, happy learning.